who are a dumbass, and Humpty Dumpty uh, tribe is with us also, but you can't see his face. And tonight we are having a panel discussion on Lord Yu's ideas about a debt. Uh, I call, what did I say? It's a, it's a whole economic way of waking up governments with mass people doing a, a uh, what, what's the word, Lord You I had it in my Dead mind. Debt strike. Debt strike. strike. Debt for strike. For climate emergency. Okay. Debt strike for a climate emergency. Forgive me. I had a brain. But I want to introduce Jennifer Torstein's here, me, Sandy Shellis, and Lord You. Thank you for being here with us from Greece. We would really like to now understand your thought process and help us. In life. Uh, okay, let me try to give you the elevator pitch. And first, oh, T? Guys, uh, it's, it's not, uh, not actually uh, live yet. So maybe we can just do the intro uh, once again. Good when practice, Ray. Right 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 right. I can yeah. see, Why, I can see that it's live. Yeah. I don't so. see it live on your channel yet. See, it's not live. Ah. Yeah, there's, not, there's no red lights showing that we're going here, Torstein. Usually mm -hmm. on Zoom. Ah, there it is. Okay. Well, that's something else. Now, and this is me recording it. This is kind of like the backup wow. recording. And then we can, uh, I no, guess I could crop it. off this, this front bit and then, yeah. you know, offer it to people, upload it, you know, and a then people can download it and, and do whatever they wish with it. A death strike for climate to avoid climate. Climate emergency. That's, a climate that's like emergency. Awesome. A climate. I've been doing this all day, and now I forget. <laughs> now you're, now you're, it's hell. Well, that's happened. because I came home and hit the vape. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you going there? Uh, hey, it's legal in New York, you know. It's legal in Colorado. Um, well, yeah. Uh, I Washington. went. Remember, you went with me. <laughs> I want to come back to your house. Oh yeah, we have to get together, do some stuff. So, Torsine, are you going to give us a five, four, three, two, one when we're really ready to begin? Uh, I can just uh, show some side with my hands or something. I don't know. Yeah, that's fine. If I say, if I say this, then it's live, okay? Okay. Five, Good. four, three, two, one. Yeah, Torsten <laughs> does like some sort of magic thing, and then we'll all just okay. animate ourselves. I've got to do something with this goddamn bowl of soup, or it's going to fall on my computer. <laughs> all right. Okay. Well, I, I was out and I did a 22 hour fast today. <gasps> so oh I my can't God. Break it. Well, I do intermittent fasting because I got to get rid of this body weight. I can't stand it. So I intermittent fast. I do keto and I haven't had sugar since the end of February and March. I haven't had any processed shit. I'm done. I oh eat vegetables. Oh God. Good girl. Yeah, I got to. I, I mean, I'm in pain all the time and I have to get rid of it because I put it all on after my, my surgery right. in 2015. And you know what? I don't like it. Ugh. Yeah. When absolutely. you saw me, I looked all right. I don't look all right now. Well, it's interesting that you said keto because everybody who looks super good these days is doing that keto diet. They just look vibrant and healthy mm -hmm. and trim and, you well, know, trim, sucked, sucked in, you know, and I'm, I just bought a book about keto last night. I'm going to do it. I'm sick of it too. So well, you can be you my keto can buddy. kind of like psycho team together on it. How's that? Would you like we to? should. And use yeah. the Sensa app that I use. I put every single thing that goes in my mouth. I I put it in there and I know my macronutrients. I've also been learning that for the last two months. You Watching are the it. biggest geek. Yes. I know all about nutrition now too. Macronutrients, oh, protein, for you. fats, everything that goes into my body because I can't work out like I used to. So I have to do this meta metabolically. You're right. And, so, and then you go into ketosis and you measure your blood with this thing and you know you're, you're, you're spilling the ketones, which burns the fat. Guys. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sandy Shellis from Environmental Coffee House, and we are probably live on Going South, which is Torstein Vidal's channel. We've got Jennifer with us. Jennifer Hines is with us and the guest of honor, except we do have one person that you can't see, and that's uh, Cambo and Littletail. But the guest of, oh, and Kevin, and Kevin. Care News has joined us. <laughs> this is wonderful. So we've got a full panel discussion with our guest of honor, Lord You Are a Dumbass, who came out of nowhere, essentially, but has educated 
a lot of us. And I've had a lot of effort into sharing who he is after Torstein shared with me. The man is a historian. He has a lot of interesting, compelling information. And the last thing that he was talking about was the debt strike to try to avert climate catastrophe if we can. So we assembled this cast of characters, Environmental Coffee House, Black Bear News, uh, Going South, Jennifer Hines, to get out a discussion about whether this is something that's even viable. Can we do it? Can we, can we get the buy-in of hundreds of thousands of people to realize that if we don't, we don't have much time? And from that, Lord you, I'm going to give it to you. Okay, is anybody getting this echo? Because I'm getting a big feedback from somebody. Can, can everybody on the panel mute or... We don't have much time. Is it me? And from that, Lord you, I'm going to give it to you. Is any, okay, is anybody getting this echo? Because I'm getting big feedback from somebody. Yeah, we're going to have to fix that, Torsby. Okay, I, uh, um, I'm going to just have to talk over the echo, but it's really strange. Um, okay. So, okay, one of uh, somebody amongst our party had this wacky idea of actually doing a debt strike um, for climate emergency. And the idea is a very dangerous one. And it's dangerous and scary because I think it just might be doable. So it was really an idea for proposing to XR, um, Extinction Rebellion. And I don't think it's really in their wheelhouse to pick it up. They're too conservative. It's too radical. And they seem to be on a path to be more conservative. I think they're gearing themselves up to be political animals and turn XR into some kind of green party. And I gather that from, you know, just a few discussions with people who are anonymous, but they sounded on social media like they could be uh, the leadership of XR. So, yeah. I thought that it's worth just discussing amongst ourselves and just seeing if there's any take up if people want to just at least discuss actually doing this idea. So, okay, what's really on the table? I want to put this proposal on the table and let's like not beat around the bush. Let's just say it as it is. And it's really, um, ultimately the aim is to collapse the global economy. Now, if that sounds kind of um, outlandish and really um, bizarre, um, then I must explain to you first that uh, the economy itself is really teetering like a drunk. And the chances that it collapses are anyway, of its own accord, are very, very high. So I think everybody expects it to collapse in grand style very shortly. Now, it could be induced, I think, with a debt strike and the participation, I don't know how big it would have to be, and that's one of the research items if we choose to go forward with this crazy idea. But I think something on the scale of what XR just did in these 10 days in London would be enough to basically detonate the entire financial system. Now, the reason for that is a strange quirk, and that's at the heart of this dark satanic machine. They wired up with all their infinite greed, something that can only be described as an atomic bomb. In fact, that's not an exaggeration. Uh, Warren Buffett described it as financial weapons of mass destruction in 2003. This bomb has actually gone off. People don't really understand, but in 2008, uh, not a lot of people really know the story of what happened. But I can tell you in a nutshell what it was, was the derivatives market imploded. And the bomb itself is the derivatives market. Now, to give you a clue of how big the derivatives bomb is, 
Uh, it's actually fairly secret about how big it is. Uh, they're very cagey. The central banks are very cagey for the reason that they don't want to spread panic and they don't want uh, the entire risk actually made public. But to give you an idea of the scale of it is the Bank of International Settlements, the BIS, admits that it's greater than 700 trillion. Now, to put that in perspective, the global economy, the entire GDP of this planet is 70 trillion. So they admit that it's 10 times bigger than the GDP. Now, nobody believes that. Any serious economist will say it's at least 1.2 quadrillion to 1.5 quadrillion. Now, what the hell are derivatives? And I can tell you quite simply by an analogy. Uh, the derivatives market did not exist before liberalization in the 1980s. Uh, it's, a, it's a demon that um, Reagan and Thatcher created. Uh, but when they got rid of Dodd-Frank and they um, unleashed uh, financialization in the 80s, it launched the derivatives market. And it's entirely unregulated. Now, what derivatives are, think of it this way. Um, say, Tommy goes into a bar, uh, has a few drinks, and can't pay. So he says to the barman, uh, here, um, I can't pay for the drinks, but here's an IOU. The barman says, okay, Tommy, I trust you, and uh, Tommy walks out of the bar. Now, what the derivatives market is, imagine the bar is filled with about 500 other people. And immediately when Tommy walks out of the bar, they immediately start gambling with each other, doing side bets on whether Tommy will pay this IOU back. To give you an idea of why it's so vulnerable is because every time Tommy comes in and gets an IOU, gives an IOU for $1 to the barman, they immediately have side bets to the tune of about $30. So when you go out and buy a house, you get a mortgage-backed security, every dollar of that fixed assets has a minimum of 30, in some estimates, 45. People then put side bets on whether you'll actually pay them back. Now, these are all things that range from uh, things that really can be equated to no more than racetrack, racetrack bets that, that you'll pay it back to what you might really... Um, call insurance against payback. So a large part of them are things like CDSs, convertible debt swaps. And that means if Tommy doesn't pay back, so the barman can get a CDS, he says, if Tommy doesn't pay me back, then I can switch it with you. You take the bad debt, you know, to somebody else. Uh, there are things like interest rate swaps, which are basically, the, say, Tommy put this bet in dollars. And if the dollar tanks, I'll switch to the yen. Uh, they're, all, they're basically all these kind of ways of hedging risk. At the same time, creating this massive balloon of counterparty debt. So, now, why did it implode? It imploded because they reached too far. They reached into the subprime mortgage uh, debt. They're basically people that are, are not debt worthy. They extended... Um, trillions worth of debt uh, to people to buy houses. And it imploded because basically they all turned toxic. They, uh, they had a formula for working out the risk and the formula didn't pan out because of why? Real world reasons. Uh, and basically theory does not translate to practice very often. Uh, and so that's what happened in this case. And that burnt the entire system down to the ground. Now, why didn't you hear about that? And why do we have an economy? Well, essentially, capitalism ended in 2008. They've covered it up. But what we've been in is a com command economy since then. It's essentially a wartime economy. Just imagine we've gone to war, it's been Pearl Harbor. Uh, there's no longer competition or fair pricing. Everything prices are set by diktats. Um, basically, food is rationed, money is rationed, everything is just fake. All the accounting is rationed, we're in wartime. And that's where we've been since 2008. 
what happened was the major thing they did was they simply suspended accounting rule 157C. And what that said was you have to mark all this bullshit to what its market value is. And that was a gap or general accounting principle. Now, they, they had to suspend that so that everybody could just cheat and say that the st all this stuff, which was now worth zero, the market froze, 1.5 quadrillion market froze on one morning. And they just said, okay, all of us are broke across the board. What we'll do is we'll just suspend the accounting rules and you can use any reasonable method of accounting uh, to account for all this worthless paper that you now have. And so accountants in general did the easiest thing and say, well, we'll just say it's worth what we paid for it. Since there's no market, it's meaningless what you paid for it. But that's what we've done since 2008. Now, a lot of economists have come and said, you bastards in the banking regulation industry, you caused this whole debacle because we were running a very good crooked operation cheating each other and you forced us to do proper accounting. So accounting rule 157C only came out about two years. It came out about in 2006. So they said it was your bloody fault for making us account properly that caused this debacle. That's how bad this is. But anyway, the point is, everybody is broke. They, bail, they bailed out people like uh, people that were credit worthy in the major banks. Um, people like Deutsche Bank, but, but all of them, there wasn't enough QE to bail them out. They've been zombies. All the banks in the world, all the big banks that matter, have been cadavers since 2008. The biggest offender of all is people like Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank is in, is in half to the tune of $55 trillion. <laughs> now compare that to the German economy. The German economy, in total, the GDP is $1.2 So there is no way in hell that Deutsche Bank is viable or ever will be in the lifetime of this planet but they threw Greece under the bus to cover that up just so they could pay the interest on essentially 55 trillion. Okay, I hope I'm not going into too much depth here. I'm, I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if that's why nothing is... Nothing okay, is wait, wait a sec, I've got, I got to switch up my volleys there, sorry. Okay. But they threw Greece under the bus. Oh, I see, yeah. Just so okay, go ahead. Okay. I'm I'm just saying I'm wondering if that's why we haven't tanked yet, you know, because they've basically shown the signs in the last three years, right? Um, I mean, Deutsche Bank has been teetering for like three or four years, and every, but everything is still going, right? You know, that like three or four years of 2014, 15, everybody was saying, this is it, here we go. The Italian banks were about to fail, German banks were about to fail, um, you know, they were they were saying the bubble's about to go, you know, a couple of years ago, and nothing's... You know, every, everything is, here we are, you know, everything's still, everything going, is still like, going, right? You know, that three or four years so ago, they did, right? They absolutely could die. This is it. Here we go. The Italian so, banks were about to so the, they are absolutely on the gurney, no life. They are decaying cadavers. What happened in three or four years ago was the, the veil slipped. Basically, the curtain around the cadavers uh, slipped. So, what happened was Deutsche Bank owed a coupon. It's just a tiny little coupon, a meaningless little thing, but it was convertible to Deutsche Bank stock. They couldn't afford the premium on this coupon. We're, um, we're talking, these guys are so bankrupt, you have to imagine it like a 19th century monarch that has you know, sold the buttons on their regalia and uh, then you know some monarch relative has to get tin buttons for him so he can come out in public. That's how bad it is. And that's, that's what happened is basically the, the, the kind of mask almost slipped off. Right. So the, now, what I'm saying to you, not everybody would agree with this assessment. So I think you people, some, some people know about MMT and modern monetary theorists. Now, these are whack jobs and crackpots that come out of academia and they say, well, you know, Keynes taught us that you can print money ad infinitum and uh, there's no wall, there's no limit you can hit. We just print our money way out of it. Now, this is complete 
horseshit. And the reason it's horseshit is for a number of reasons. One of them is that this money is not free. According to the Federal Reserve System, you pay 6%. All of us in America are paying 6% for every dollar that we get from the Fed for quantitative easing, or rather the Treasury does. And so uh, MMT theorists ignore that. They also ignore, ignore the fact that you cannot hide the fact that when they do quantitative easing, that money goes to the national debt. And the national debt can only get so big before credit grading in America itself will be downgraded. Now, that's a vicious cycle because a downgrade in America's debt uh, automatically means that they can't basically borrow. They can't get bonds and give out treasury notes um, or the ability to be will be downgraded. And that will mean that they will be caught up in another one of our sins that have been going on since 1971. And that's that all this mountain of essentially petrodollars will be repatriated to America. Um, China owes about a quarter of all that America's debt. So the dominoes will fall. If America is downgraded, basically China will fall like a, like a domino and uh, the rest of the world goes. So, there's a lot riding on this little IOU of Tommy's. <laughs> and they printed their way out uh, with three ser series of quantitative easing um, since 2008. They can't do it again. They're out of ammo. Uh, they can't service the quantitative easing debt that they've got under the current system. And politically, it would be almost untenable for them to to basically bail them out again. I mean, there's been too much exposure now. People like Yanis Varoufakis has written books and there's no one in Greece that is under any doubt that they were deliberately thrown under the bus with 40 years of austerity and people are suffering here, really suffering. Uh, and they're going to be suffering for another 40 years, even though they said, oh, Greece emerged from bankruptcy. It was just propaganda. It's, uh, they emerge from the term of a cover letter. They, haven't they won't emerge from um, austerity for two generations. It's a crime of monumental proportion because nobody here is in any doubt of the truth. And the truth was that the whole Greek scandal was just to funnel money secretly to Deutsche Bank so that they could keep afloat. Okay, so uh, now, that kind of thing is well known around the world, so it's not really possible to print their way out of this one because also it's politically untenable because I can't foresee them doing Occupy Movement. Occupy Movement was a failure. I think uh, central bankers know that there's very likely blood on the streets if they do another Lehman-style uh, bailout. Now, okay, that's some bunch of whack jobs, the MMT guys. There's another bunch of whack jobs. Uh, the well, economists will tell you, follow me. <laughs> no, there's no risk. There's uh, basically all the, all the basically guys in the bar that have bets against each other. They all counterparties and each counterparty has a counterparty risk. So they all net out to zero. Therefore, there's no risk. Well, that's complete baloney because it also assumes that the entire debt, uh, the debts are all symmetrical, that Paul owes Peter $1 for a bad bet and Peter owes Paul $1 for a bad bet. And you can bet that it's not symmetrical and somebody's out there that really is exposed on a vast one-way bet. They're probably Lehman Brothers galore that nobody knows about hiding in, the, in this woodpile. Um, so that's a, a nonsense argument. The other argument is, all one of these 500 bettors in the bar is actually broke themselves. So they have 1.5 quadrillion in bets, and they actually penniless, a lot of them. So they have to, in practical terms, to settle the bets. The losers essentially have to come up with 750 trillion, and there isn't that amount of money in the universe. So it's a bogus argument to say there's no risk in the derivatives market. There's massive, massive risk. Um, uh, the question is, how far can they go papering it up? Now, uh, the, their exposure is 
monumental on all fronts um, because while they've been holding down the money at zero, made free money, uh, it's allowed people like, you know, basically private equity firms like KKR to do these massive raids. So the, there've been raids like, for example, Toys R Us. So Toys R Us were decimated because of private equity firms like KKR, they came in, um, they basically do a leverage buyout, they get money at zero percent. Um, because they're big borrowers, they go and buy a place like Toys R Us on leverage. They then uh, load up the company with debt, take huge amounts in fees, then walk away, let the company collapse uh, under that debt burden. And that's what happened to Toys R Us. Everybody else then went, oh, they can't compete with Amazon. No, they can't survive a bear raid is, is what happened. And that's what's been happening then. There have been bubbles blowing out everywhere. Everybody knows this can't continue. Um, but now the proposal is we start a mass default on one of these classes of debt. And so the thing would be a popular debt strike. On, I would choose somewhere like November the 5th. Um, and then uh, the aim is to uh, deliberately collapse the economy. Now, why would you want to do something like that? Well, if you have a look at all the things that have worked to reduce CO2, of all the government policies, all the, the personal initiative, all the individual action, all the collective action, uh, the state action, um, all the transfer to, of technologies to get onto LNG from coal and all these things, None of them have worked. Not a single one of them have had any impact on CO2 emissions. To date, you can fact check me on this, but as far as I know, there's only been one thing that reduced CO2 emissions, and that was the collapse in 2008. So when that happened, politicians claimed that it was because of all of the new policies, particularly switching to LNG, which was very convenient for them, natural gas. Um, but, and particularly Obama claimed all the credit for uh, basically reducing CO2. But he was soon exposed, and by 2010, studies were coming out showing that, uh, no, it had nothing to do with the government policies. It was entirely the slowdown, the economic slowdown. Now, the slowdown was immense. It was about 11 to 12% reduction in CO2, which almost exactly matched the slowdown in the economy. And it was conclusively proved that when the economy picked up, CO2 emissions picked up absolutely correlated in lockstep. So it is a point of fact that the only thing that stops CO2 emissions is a collapse in the economy. So it follows that it correlates exactly. So you can stop CO2 emissions, you can bring them to zero if you collapse economic activity to zero. Okay, and I have one question, if you don't mind. Can you hear me? I'm getting this massive echo, so I, I'll try to hear you. It's because there's a lag. Everybody's hearing us later. My only thing is with this, is, and it's fascinating since I have been reading and studying about this, is then uh, the personal responsibility and buy-in of a large enough population of people globally that would do this to have it actually happen. I mean, there's, you know, you make a choice of personal, you, you just say, okay, I'm done and I'm going to do this, but that's your personal finances, your life. And maybe you can help us a little bit understand the individual and how this would work for the individual. Okay, I just figured out the source of the echo. I, I had, the, had the YouTube thing on in the background, so thank God for that. Okay, okay. 30 uh, lashes with a wet okay, noodle. So, so, for the person, <laughs> so, so you were saying, for, you know, could it be an individual action to do it? 
Well, no, I was actually saying how, I mean, you can't be an individual action, but how would it work? How would we work it with our finances and and all that? I know you talked about that on your video, um, but how also we get the buy-in of enough people to make it happen so that those of us that do it aren't left like in the middle of the road writing these checks to the treasury and then (laughs) nobody else does it. Ah, okay. So you, I would propose that we do something like this as a game plan. Um, the first thing I would put at the top of the agenda that we need to um, look at and discuss is the McPherson paradox and uh, Alay feels that we would lose the global dimming effect. Um, so that deserves some discussion. Um, then I would suggest that we proceed on to, if we still like what we're hearing, we proceed on to the next stage. And that the next stage would be due to do due diligence on all this stuff. And I would propose we do that by having a short list of heavy hitters and uh, celebs, um, you know, that we, uh, you know, cordially invite to be on our channels. And we draw up a list we share them amongst the channels, and then through collective action, we basically hound these people till it's easier to have an interview <laughs> to get, basically to get rid of us. Um, but, uh, you know, the kind of guys I'm thinking are people like uh, David Graeber, who wrote uh, Debt the First 2000 Years. He's one of the people that started um, uh, Occupy. And he, he's proposed in, uh, in his book for a debt jubilee. Um, so, yeah, he's a fellow anarchist. I don't know him personally. Um, the, then there are people like uh, Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert who have been saying, you know, basically this is Armageddon is coming, uh, financially speaking and climatologically speaking. <laughs> and... Um, they they were they tremendous sources. They're people like uh, Nassim Taleb, you know, who wrote The Black Swan. And he, um, you know, this is up his, uh, uh, just uh, this is in his wheelhouse too. Um, also tipping effects and things like um, uh, Surawiki and um, wrote uh, books like um, The Wisdom of Crowds and things like that. The, the, that kind of collective action um, of crowds. There's also the guy who did, I can't remember his name now, but he, he the guy who started the Pirate Party, um, he did exactly this kind of launch. And he has a playbook on actually how to do it. So I was just halfway through reading that. Maybe Torstein knows about that. Do you know about the Pirate Party, Torstein? Sweden. Uh, hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, is, is that the guy called Dumscheid or something? I don't know. Uh, let me see. I think I can quickly look up his name. He's he's called. Um, uh, but maybe I can uh, do a little uh, uh, catching up. Uh, okay, wait. I'm two seconds away from his name. It is ah uh, uh, Rick uh, Falkvinger. Okay, okay. Hi, in Sweden. Rick yeah. Mm. <laughs> but um, um, Lord Hugh, <clears throat> there are some uh, important things uh, that we need to consider here and the first of them is like um, oh, you know of course uh, Extinction Rebellion the stuff they did in London was just amazing uh, and and the, even though it was amazing it was in a way the easy part you know the hard part is going over to the politicians and getting something out of it right so so that's uh, they are in an impossible situation uh, almost but um for for the suggestion with the with the debt jubilee and, and the the bomb uh, aspect of it <clears throat> uh, one problem in your resonant resonant man in your in your uh, argument is that you're saying that we need to do this in order to uh, stop the climate uh, running amok, right? And then there's a question, are we looking forward to um, the tipping point, the big tipping point for the climate, or are we looking back at it? Is it 
two, three, four decades uh, behind us, right? So I'm, I'm thinking if you're going to detonate what you call an economic nuclear bomb, uh, we have to really, really think this through. And we have to know that it, uh, the effect of it could stop a runaway climate and uh, not uh, the climate already being in a runaway state, right? So that's one, that's one thing. And then also you have the problem of uh, the nukes. The audience the is saying they can't hear you, Torstein. The spent... They should be able to, to hear me. I can hear you. You can hear me? I can, I can hear you. You can hear me. Yeah. I think everybody yeah. can. Oh. Yeah. I can hear you. Uh, the, oh, the spent fuel rods. Uh, yeah. We have, uh, we have uh, 400 uh, nuclear power stations that are maybe going to, to go belly up if you oh, have, so. uh, if you have uh, an econ economic collapse. So I think we should do as the Cure did when they came to Roskilde in 2000 and then into 2001 uh, to say that uh, we have some unfinished business here, you know, uh, because we are going to leave this, uh, this planet without a civilization in, in a number of years anyway, whatever we do. And I think that we as humans, we have unfinished business. And I'm talking with a guy called, a professor called... Um, uh, Sid Smith, uh, and I've suggested that maybe what we have to do before we can really enjoy the end, which he talks about, is that we have to rocket all the all the nuclear waste into space. You know, I, I, I just watched his video. I just watched his video tonight, so I just yeah. watched his video a few hours ago. So yeah, I was I was impressed. Um, yeah, these are the kind of points that I would put next after the McPherson paradox is, is, is this ethically what we want to do? Um, personally, I think the tipping points on the rear view mirror. So um, for me, why I would say this is morally justified is <coughs> um, to raise this topic now, maybe it's a bit too premature, but <coughs> I would say that it's going to happen anyway. And so um, it would be a kind of vehicle to start discussing. I mean, financial meltdown is going to happen anyway. So it would be a vehicle uh, to get the conversation going about just the topics that you're talking about. Um, to You see, one of the things about talking to this um, list of heavy hitters would be <coughs> to surface all the um, unknown unknowns. So exactly the kind of things you're saying. And, uh, and then basically they, it would be discussed in a rather interesting forum. The mainstream media have established that they can't talk about climate change because it's bad for ratings. I think they can definitely talk about a bunch of people that want to deliberately make an attack on the sacred cow, the economy. I think that is very newsworthy. <laughs> and on the back of that, we could discuss all these topics which are now outside the Overton window. You, you will not get a mainstream discussion on what to do with nukes uh, any time before Armageddon. Um, unless you surface it in this way and couch it in um, basically these terrorists that are you know, basically making an assault on the sacred cow. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking today about um, how you could how you could bring those these kind of subjects up politically, you know, in, into a mainstream conversation, right? I mean, you have you have politicians in the U.S. saying like, okay, you know, we have to climate change has to be on the table and it has to be a, a, a main issue. You have the U.K. Parliament declaring a climate emergency. You have this political kind of movement and will developing, you know. But the thing is, is they're, you know, they're obviously not, you know, they're very far from the, the actual, the problems of the McPherson paradox, the nuclear power plants, the, you know, they're, they're very far away from what actually needs to be done, but at least they're saying, oh, hey, we need to do something. So, you know, yes, how do we get, how do we get those issues into the conversation as quickly as possible? Because they have to be, you know, 
because if, if there's if there's those kind of conversations going on politically and then you have a meltdown which i i totally see coming like probably this year because as gas prices go up right like michael rupert said like the last the last 2008 wasn't just the mortgage derivatives it was fuel you know it was energy prices going up sustain, sustained you know high uh high energy prices for you know a year and that drove everything into the ground you know so you have these derivatives, this derivative, huge derivative bubble, and then you have energy prices going all over the place. And if they go up high enough for long enough, then that's it. You know, that's you know, we could see that happen very, very quickly. But you have to get those com- those things into the conversation as quickly as possible. Like, hey guys, if we have an economic meltdown, who's going to take care of the nuclear reactors? If we have, you know, if we lose <laughs> all this global dimming what are we going to do with, you know, a sudden rise, sudden one C rise? Like what, you know, how do we, how do we, isn't this, isn't this the perfect vehicle for that? Because yeah. if we can be establish ourselves as a bunch of bottom mine off nuts that are trying to rally everybody to deliberately pull the plug on the economy. I mean, I think that is very newsworthy discussion points that, you know, that's a vehicle you can raise these important issues on. I mean, who could not, discuss that as a reason for why these nuts should be stopped <laughs> you know and you say like you just people will be hearing about the McPherson paradox for the first time they'll be hearing about the nukes they they'll be hearing that you know all these green energy solutions are pointless and uh hearing interesting facts like you know chernobyl's still a mess fukushima is a disaster that is only half done yet and you know all these things that nobody realizes at the moment they they don't know that the 450 nuclear power stations that uh, are liable to be melted down and can't be decommissioned in 70 years. All these things are outside the Overton window and can't be discussed, but they can in the context of, you know, these freaky nuts that want to destroy the economy. So I think it's, it's great. I'm interested in feedback from Sam. I mean, Hambo. <laughs> he's sitting Hambo. back. He's not on the, on the screen, but I'd like to get a little feedback from him Thank on the you. discussion. <laughs> are you there? Are you there? Hambone? He's muted. All right. There he is. Oh, there he is. To, uh, to unmute. Now, 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 guys, as I tried to tell you when we started into this, this, this is not my area of expertise. I'm, I'm just going to fall back on the old line I've been saying for nine years. Uh, well, a couple of things. I tore up all of my credit cards nine years ago. I have not paid one penny of interest in my life for 10 years. This is one, this is the number one piece of advice I have to anybody out there is stop feeding these sons of bitches behind it all. So we all need to tear up our credit cards. I have no car payment. I have no mortgage payment. That's my number one piece of advice on one of my very first videos. I was giving that advice. The, the other thing that I've mentioned many times is uh, Ayn Rand was uh, in 1957. This is no one talks about the most important passage in Atlas Shrugged. It's one that a lefty politician was, uh, I'm sorry, the lefty uh, uh, professor was was in this heated debate with uh, this industrialist, what I would call a planet eater, and the planet eater was laughing at this, uh, you know, there were the, you know, the little lefty talking about all the regulations on industry and all of this and how government and politicians need to take a stronger role on cracking down on the planet eaters. And this planet eater laughed in his face, said there is one way, there is one way to put us out of business, and that is to stop buying our products. This was, you know, Ayn Rand, who uh, was defending the, 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 obviously, the industrialist point of view and, and trying to get government regulation off the, uh, you know, I'm sure Donald Trump is, uh, is a big supporter of Ayn Rand if he could actually read a book. But uh, the, that's the bottom line, guys. There's one way to put these bastards out of business. It is, it is to stop buying their products. 
but as the industrialist was saying to the professor, you're never going to do it. All, all of you little lefty whatevers, it's never going to happen. You're going to sit there and complain and whine about us. You're going to keep buying our products. We're going to keep going right on about our business and laughing all the way to the banksters behind it all. Not a damn thing has changed since 1957, since Ayn Rand wrote that. The problem is 10 times as worse. And again, it's a, I, I fully support any one of these efforts, I am 100% behind you guys, but I joined this, uh, it was November 5th, 2019 for me 10 years ago. And the fact that Hambone Littletail uh, has not paid one penny of interest to these evil sons of bitches, I have not noticed one difference in the uh, state of the planet since I made that decision. And so while I encourage you, uh, I, I assure you, I will be joining you and not paying any debt to any of these people because I have no debt. I have okay, so zero debt in my life. I have had zero debt in my life for 10 years. And that's really all I have to add. Uh, this is one of the few times that I can actually say, uh, do as I do. And, and, and so, so Hambone, it's it's kind of cards. it's kind of more than that. It's it's what what it really is is an intervention, so on other people's crack habit. So, in other words, to do this action properly, you would have to really go up and get you know up to the hilt in debt, and then default on November the fifth. The idea is that you seize up the credit markets. So, uh, the the effects of that is people won't have the ability to emit CO2 because they won't have the ability to get credit. All the CO2 is, is emitted on credit. So you would basically, what you're really doing is eroding uh, confidence in the market. So there's risk in the market and they can, they can quantify that risk. What this is doing is creating uncertainty and that freezes the market. There wouldn't be a data left uh, because there wouldn't be any creditors. Now, one of the major creditors in all of this, or major would-be debtors, is uh, Xi, Xi Jinping. He wants to basically save China or preserve his neck by keeping China growing at about 6%. He can only do that with a massive tranche of borrowing, and that's what China is about to do. There's no way they could do it if, there were, if the credit market was a liquid. So it's a question of basically destroying the crack market. It's not, your example is staying off crack. What we're proposing here is destroying confidence in the crack market. So basically the tables are overturned and everybody vacates the crack market. I, I, again, I 100% I, I support you on this effort, whether it's, whether it's going to uh, p penetrate the, the juggernaut or not. I, I, I have my doubts. I don't know how I personally can be part of this. I cannot uh, get the credit to, uh, pay, to buy a big pen on layaway at Walmart right now. I, I let my credit rating go. So I, so I will not be borrowing any of right. uh, what, what about the other? Or ever again, as long as I live, nobody, uh, it would be fool enough to... Uh, now, 10 well, years ago, I could have borrowed a million dollars and run it up. But. Okay, so this, okay. Is, this is not really about individual action for us. For us, it's about basically <laughs> agit prop. So for us, it's basically getting interview candidates, raising the possibility that this will happen. This is not something we're, we're – it's, it's not something that the people in this forum are going to lay the you know, credit rating on the line for. Uh, we would be in the business of exploring it as an idea and then promoting the idea as far as possible. So it's not, it doesn't require action on our part. It just means that we would have to interview people, explore the idea, publi publicize the idea. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the, so, yeah, so I think the way we would interview is with a list of, you know, people that we divide amongst all the channels and then uh, we divvy, divvy the people that will be interviewed up, I don't think they can, they're not in a position to actually endorse something like this, but what we would want out of them to quantify the size of what, how big this action would be, exactly how many participants, 
um, and to surface unknown unknowns. Now, and it would target the big, target the banks, the banksters, the big banks. Would it not? Is that uh, what you were? Well, okay, so this is what I'd say is that the smart way is to, I think, and this is all to, for due diligence and research, but I think what you'd do is you'd take uh, certain types of debt first. So I would say that you would start off uh, with um, student loans, uh, credit card debt, and medical bills. Um, and those would be the first things you start with. And the reason is there's a broad age demographic in those. If you do, student loans are ripe to go anyway because students uh, know that they've been suckered and they know that they, unless they're in a STEM job, they're going to go out with 30K of debt after their graduation and they're going to go out into unemployment and they're going to be, their credit rating is going to be screwed anyway. So they prime to default. In, in a lot of ways, um, what we're doing here is giving people the right to default with dignity. The credit card debt is, you've got to imagine, single parents and moms out there that are going to default anyway. Um, and then the medical bills are the, basically the senior generation. So if you can get a cross-generational uh, consensus that this has to happen, um, it's going to happen anyway. So, you know, you, you are getting people that would default uh, because they're under duress and you're just saying to them, now we're giving you default with dignity. Now you can do it as an act as a social justice warrior and not as some American loser that's fallen in the gutter, which is what people feel about themselves. So it's, it's a psychological thing as well. And, but, and, and uh, the one thing about this is, you know, yes, it's a psychological thing, but you start giving up or, or trying to get people to buy in on, okay, Default on your student loan, just don't pay it, and then you have other assets or whatever. How is somebody who really wants to make a difference not or supposed to live or not be totally frightened so that we can get the momentum going and saying there's power in numbers? How do you do that? Uh, so that's it's the collective active action problem, and that's the it's the classic problem that all activists have is that we know that we can beat the grasshoppers um, if all the ants will step forward. The question is, no one wants to step forward in case nobody else comes with them. So that's the collective action problem, and it's the classic problem that is all revolutionaries have had to face. Now. This is slightly different uh, for the collective action problem because it's the threat alone can destabilize the markets. So if you pick a date out far enough, like November the 5th, um, and then uh, what you do is, I think, okay, if we had a no-go go, no go decision after we've interviewed and done due diligence with all these celebrities, then uh, I think what we would do is we would... Um, we would get cells, you know, so it's sort of like cells of, like the pirate party, you get cells of seven people, one leader, one deputy. Uh, what uh, would happen is you try and get those cells to metastasize, but in, in essence, they would have Tupperware parties where you would get uh, buy-in and you'd get people to pledge that they would default on their debt, um, you know, on this date. And, and, or you can have, you know, like in the 80s when they had, you know, after the good times ended in the 80s, people had credit card uh, cutting um, parties where they, they take all their friends to the bar, run up their last bill on the credit card, and then cut the credit card up. And so these things you would, you would basically, if you can't pay your, your debts, you would, you would have a, one of these parties, you would write a letter of intent to your creditor and say that on November the 5th, you intend to default. Um, and then... By the way, to just give you an idea of how bad it is to actually do this letter of intent, I'm not sure, I have to be, have to be fact-checked on the legality, but if you send your creditor a letter of intent and say that I'm going to default on some distant date like the November the 5th, your creditor is pretty much screwed. Imagine, imagine if a guy who's you know, a parasite living off all these people and all the, all the hosts that he's living off send him a letter of intent saying they're going to default on November the 5th. He can't do anything about it. You have to fact check me there on my law. But yeah, I think in most states in America, you, he wouldn't be able to get any more credit because basically it would be fraud if he's got a letter of intent saying that he's going to get a default on that date. 
but he wouldn't have, be able to do anything to the uh, data until they fell behind. So they would be roundly screwed for months, and basically that's at the expense of a letter. Uh, people can go through with this and just say publicly, just you know, to a poll, they can swear blind that they're going to do this and then not follow through. It's even, it's even possible to take this down to November the 4th and just say, hey, just kidding, we'd never do something like that. Because you don't know that once you let this genie, no one knows, once you let this genie out of the box, this monster might just run. The whole point is you're creating uncertainty in the market. You, you reduce you're making, they can't price uncertainty. So that alone wrecks the market. So uh, you can get uh, everybody to, you know, do collective action, get raise awareness. Um, so after we got like cells of seven and stuff, I'd say that what they should do would be to try to create other cells, regional cells, and they should go after uh, celebrity endorsements and funding. And I think this funding wouldn't take much because it's um, really kind of grassroots action. Uh, but if you can get celebrity endorsements, uh, yeah, they, they would, you see, in a lot of ways, you just want to create the threat that it's going to happen, right? It's, it's, it's as powerful as actually carrying through. So you just have to look for ways where people can pledge that they will go through with this. And then everybody has to guess what happens on November the 5th. Except that we've made this video and now those people might even be... No, they can watch this video. All Everything I've said, if you, know. if you were yeah, a bank they would, they would you know, know exactly what I've said and you still can't tell, right? If, if people answer a poll, if you educate people to say, whatever you're going to do on November 5th, say you will default, it's as good as defaulting. Now, nobody can, you know, nobody can with confidence come back and say, yeah, Byron estimates we think that, you know, 50% of these people are jokers, you know, like, oh, take that to the bank and see what happens. If it looks like there's going to be a general default on November the 5th, I can tell you by October, the markets will implode. Kevin, what do you think? Well, I, I like this idea in general and um and and I, and I like specifically the letter of intent like that to me seems so like something that's very simple that people can do and it doesn't involve court going to court and you know doesn't involve you know it, it's if you can get a bunch of people to do this all at once i like that um I think it can be effective and i just so i just want to say very quickly i don't have a lot of time because i have to um okay. make dinner for my daughter but uh uh, so I, I would like to propose another idea in addition to this idea, the, to the debt default idea. And I don't know why nobody has done this or nobody's tried this, but I've been thinking about it for a while. So we have all these climate strikes. We have people marching. We have day of, days of action on Friday, every Friday. We have school strikes. We have a raising awareness. We have a rising tide of you know, people willing to take action, but what nobody has. So we're all talking about stop fossil fuels, cut emissions, but nobody is boycotting gas. Nobody's boycotting right. gasoline. Nobody's boycotting oil. Nobody's. And I understand how difficult it is to do that because if people have to go to work or people have to, you know, but what I'm saying is if you could coordinate an oil strike or a gas gasoline strike in conjunction with the school strikes or with, other protests around climate change. It's a very simple, you know what I mean? Like, duh, gas, we're, you know, we're, we gotta stop burning fossil fuels. So let's not buy gas on this day. Let's hit the pockets of the oil companies, right? Let's, you know, we don't have, we just pick a day. It could be every Friday or every Sunday. We have just a general gas strike. Um, and the oil companies would know on this day that they'd be losing revenue. And that would also shake financially. That would really, if, if, if it hurt them financially enough, if you had enough people globally doing this, they would be losing enough, enough money to create, you know, you would create problems in the market from that as well. So I, I'm not saying this, doing this instead of, I'm saying in addition to yeah. the debt default idea, which I really like, but I, I'm actually contemplating starting a, a, a fossil fuel strike, you know, like every, you know, I just have a Facebook page, like fossil fuel strike and just, just it. hammer, hammer it along and do it along in conjunction with the school strike. And that is a financial blow to the to the entire system. 
and it would probably it's a, I don't know, you know. Great warm up. It's a great warm up for you know that to and also raising you know would raise awareness, mm -hmm. etc. So I'm just, but I like this idea. I like what you're presenting, and uh, I just want to present that idea as well. I would like to put some momentum behind that, and I will, you know, I'll be letting people know when that happens. But I, you awesome. Know, if Work we with get us. It, it's <laughs> training for people to prepare for something like this. It's kind of like a mini strike as uh, a training ground for, you know, a big financial one. Right. And if we can do, you know, if you can get enough of these pillars of contention in society, you know, of, you know, we're not going to do this. We're not playing the game anymore. Right. We're not going to buy the fossil fuels. We're not going to pay our debts. We're not going to, you know, we, we no confident vote of no confidence in, you know, the, the industrial civilization, as it is, you know, and then you can find other ways to do this. You know, you'd have shopping strikes. You can have, uh, um, I don't, you know, whatever you can, you know, you can have, I think the idea of debt Jubilee has been out there for a while. So if you raise awareness around a debt Jubilee or debt, you know, um, just taking people out of the debt system, you know, I think, you know, you have people who have been talking for a long time about not paying, you know, not paying income taxes. I was just talking to a friend who he doesn't register his car. There's actually, there, there's some kind of legality around. You don't actually have to register your, your vehicle <laughs> in, <laughs> in the United States, but they make you do it. They scare you into doing it, but there's a legal loophole. And I was like, Oh my God, if you got a bunch of people to stop registering their cars, you know, you would, you know, you would take out a lot of, revenue you know you just kevin you've really been uh thinking about these things. i've been thinking about this <laughs> but, but, but kevin, it. you know one of the amazing things about it is that it should be supported by the elites all the bad guys should actually support this because it's bleeding some of the aggression out of the public and they looking at the pitchforks this these kind of actions might save their necks so yeah. I can imagine that they would actually support it. You know, some of the biggest villains might actually support this because it basically um, takes some of the steam out of the. <laughs> a, right, and a they're all yeah. Wow. Well, if it is, it, it's a, if it's a debt jubilee, like a true debt jubilee, like then, um, it's how a lot of people would be behind that of course you're going to crash the system so yeah you know well, I think anybody who's like yes we can do this you know it's going to wipe everybody out so you know but afterwards you know everything will come together again but yeah but uh, you yeah, see what i point out is that people want to do a green new deal they have to burn the system down first i mean roosevelt's yeah. roosevelt's new deal was how to build the system up after it had collapsed that's why it worked you can't get a system running flat out and say, hey, we're going to transform it with a new deal. It's, you know, who's going to buy into that? Right. You know, if you look at CO2 charts over the last couple hundred years, especially since like 1900, you see right after World War II, right? You know, because it's kind of going along, going along, and then it takes all of a sudden the, the solidest big dip that it ever took, and it kind of takes a big dip. And that's when the Roosevelt Initiative with the New Deal and everything like that started to ramp up. But that shows the inextricable link between um, the economy, CO2 emissions, right. and consequently climate at large. So that's one thing that kind of like occurred to me. And another thing that occurred to me was the interlocking exponentiation of the different cycles that we're on. So we have exponentiation in a lot of different ways right now. We all know, those of us have been watching climate and looking at climate, we're on an absolutely exponential path. And you can kind of see that steep curve. But the same goes for the economy. And um, I think that all these exponential feedbacks are all inextricably linked. And then the other thing that occurs to me, Lord Hugh, when you were giving your um, initial overview and summary, you made some statements about Deutsche Bank. And, um, you know, it occurs to me that Deutsche Bank's been in the news an awful lot lately, um, as well 
I mean, Deutsche Bank's a known money laundering operation. It's extremely corrupt. And, you know, right now what's happening in the United States is the big Russia probe has come out. And of course, Trump's finances are very, very interlinked with Deutsche Bank. In fact, Trump had gone bankrupt so many times that Deutsche Bank was on, the only one that would give him money. And Deutsche Bank, I believe, is all, also interlinked with uh, Russia and, and Putin. And I just was wondering if you would be willing to comment about that. Yeah, I mean, they're all rotten. So HSBC has actually been prosecuted for supporting terrorists. So they have uh, know, your, know Your Customer. Um, uh, um, what's it called? Know Your Own Customer, NYOC. But uh, that means a regulation that they force the banks to be self-policing on all these crooks. So if they suspect money laundering and stuff, which, uh, you know, basically these scumbags are all doing, or terrorist activity or anything like that, they are supposed to report it. Um, and they not only don't, they've actually participated in being prosecuted. They just did um, settlements uh, with no complicity. So they did no admission or guilt settlements. HSBC is probably the worst. But Deutsche Bank too, they've been, uh, they've been financing outside of sanctions. Um, it's, it's just a complete... Uh, yeah, it's just, they banked us. So if you want to read more about that, uh, one person I think we should put on the interview list is Naomi Prince, who's been exposing the bankster racket and how they've been colluding, you know, with, <laughs> with, <laughs> with uh, hostile state actors that are actually on the terrorist list. Every, everybody from Hezbollah to, um, to the Saudis, uh, you know, so, you know, it's, it's rotten to the core. Um, but, you, um, you'll only bring it down, though, with uh, collective action. I don't think, I think they're all invulnerable politically, and that's what HSBC and all these guys approved. They pay small fines, and the fines in no way uh, make it uneconomical to stop the crimes, because the fines are so small compared to the profits that they get from these deals. And there's no criminal culpability. Since 2008, there hasn't been a single prosecution for malfeasance so much that in previous centuries they would have hung for it. Um, so, yeah, it's a reflection on how bad the, the system is. But this is the way to bring it down because everybody knows about it. It's all been exposed and now we're in the post-truth post era. Nobody gives a damn about crime anymore. So... Uh, uh, to Kevin's question is, this is not directed at the politicians. In a sense, what you're saying with the debt strike is, you guys are fired. We, don't, we think you're incompetent and malfeasant, and we're firing you. We're taking action in, on our own. And I think that's XR's mistake, is they, they're really elevating the politicians, appointing them as white knights when they're really just carbon criminals. So they're buttering up their ego and burnishing the politicians' uh, halos when they actually criminals and they should be dismissing them and bypassing them. And I think that's one of XR's mistakes. And I can only imagine they're doing it because they fancy themselves uh, with some kind of career ambition as politicians, um, which it's a terrible thing to say they're piggybacking on a climate emergency for some kind of personal professional ambition. But that's my only conclusion based on their moderate tactics is they want to make sure they're not unelectable. Um, I really think yeah, so. I mean, rather than rather than appealing to them, you know, I I, I totally get that. Like, uh, I, I think you have to suck the energy out of the system in the way you know, uh, and that's that's why I pro was proposing some kind of like strike uh, or boycott, general boycott, because you suck, you know, you start collapsing the system. You start just like Hambone was talking about. You stop buying their shit. You stop. You know, and I just don't see, I don't see boycotts being done at, you know, very rarely there's Sean King, uh, does, you know, has done some boy, boycotts. He's a, um, black lives matter activist, but they, you know, that's, he's the only person I've seen organizing boycotts in the last 10, 20, 30 years. Like, it's just something that people don't engage in and it's really damaging. It's very damaging to the so system. This you know? is. The boycotts are very, very powerful. They were done in South Africa. So uh, during the anti-apartheid era, 
um, the late in the struggle, uh, we kind of fi- realized about the power of boycotts. So there are a number of things that boycotts is they must be targeted. So, um, and also you can put some demand on it. So then you, you say like uh, you have a fuel boycott with the aim of re- uh, getting rid of the fossil fuel subsidy. I mean, I mean, can you believe that there's still <laughs> right. fossil fuel sub- subsidy, subsidy for God's sake, they're not even yeah. trying. I um, mean, you say that it's for that, but the other thing is you can create supply shocks. So for instance, you can run up. So everybody has, you know, a massive uh, run up uh, as a prelude to basically the strike. And what that does is it creates a supply shock that can be fatal for the supply line. So in other words, people will restock shelves of a certain item and they will build up inventory so that when the strike comes, they left with all this inventory and it becomes a nightmare for them. So much so that you can take down a big corporation with a big enough, um, you know, supply shock. Yeah. But it, as the as the protest gets more and more sophisticated, you can start doing these things. But the thing about boycotts, uh, they are enforceable because you can basically have social action against scabs and blacklegs. But it got nasty in South Africa. It got to the point where uh, people that shopped on the shopping days, they would have, be forced to, you know, say, drink... Um, products that they bought at the supermarket from bleach to, you know, wow. Russian power yeah. and that they, they were force fed them. And so it can get brutal, but the point remains is you can uh, do everything from social shaming to all the way to tire burning people for, um, for being scabs. Right. Strike breakers. Yeah. Um, but all of these things are late. The thing is to introduce the public the main thing about a debt strike is uh, to show them where the on-off button is to the economy. So they have the power to threaten um, a debt strike. Yeah. But anyway, I think at this point we should discuss what we should do next. I mean, I, I would propose that we get this list together. We will pitch in with a pool of interview candidates and then we figure out a way of divvy them up. I mean, that's where I'd like to go next is, is everybody up for this? And what's the, take a temperature check at this point. Okay. And well, I'll you, speak first about up to it. I, I would like to be, I'm not making guarantees as far as how much I can participate at this moment with physical issues. But I think that starting online, uh, a boycott type of thing, Kevin, with all of our channels, everybody's voice, you know, start with something small to roll up to the letter of intent to default day in November. And I'd be absolutely willing to do what's within my, you know, limitations. And I will, um, as far as, because I think that some kind of wake up call has to happen, but I'd, I'd like to work in concert with Kevin and, and Taurus Stein, because this has to go worldwide. This just can't be like, you know, 52 American doomers. I mean, this has to be something that we get everybody familiar with and, uh, and, and lead up. And then the letter of intent has to be written. Does it have to be written legally? Can it be just written professionally with certain specific things in it? You know, so we have a lot of planning if, if this is going to be pulled off and people have to join us. They want to, they have to believe in this, that we can do something else because we are in a climate emergency and that's well, the buy-in and the marketing. It's a lot. Well, I think at this stage we're still just chatting. So we, we, we just in due diligence and I really like the idea of due diligence by talking to these personalities because there's some fascinating interview subjects. This is, this is new stuff. I haven't heard any stuff like this. And, you know, it's like Torsten was saying, on the back of this, you can introduce some very um, fringe subjects that should be mainstream, and they just not. And, you know, I would love to hear what somebody like Yanis Varoufakis would say about, you know, the McPherson paradox. I bet your ass he's never heard of it. And uh, it would, you know... Uh, he's got real clout. Um, so, uh, yeah, I had a, I did have a, a small email exchange with him, but and not enough to warrant 
an interview and stuff. I'm not really in contact with them. But I just give that to you as basically, I think everybody on this channel could have some phenomenally interesting interviews. And so it's very low commitment. Wouldn't scientists, we need to get scientists on board. Well, well, how do we physically assemble this list and how do we divvy it up? Well, that's well, Lord, Lord, hey, just so you know, I mean, I uh, getting the people to interview is is ninety percent of the work. the The interview is uh, at least on Collapse Chronicle. That that's the fun part. I I have a fellow down in Brazil who helps me with this. It, it's unbelievable what it takes to the, 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 just the amount of work. I mean, I am all ears, but uh, I, I admit this is a little, uh, you know, I'm fully going to admit this is a little bit out of my league and I'm not going to be running in the circles where the, the people who could talk to me intelligently about this are going to come across my radar in, in my regular life. You are very, welcome i am always encouraging people to send me so if, if you can send me some ideas but i i you know i'm afraid i'm not going to be able to generate i will be but you can talk about it i'm what, what very size? happy to listen to your ideas and uh after i con after i vet them and contact them if they're up for it i would be happy to participate would it, in would that. It, would it work if we came up with a list um, and then uh, just try and solicit them through collective action? So we get, you know, everybody involved to try and guilt, persuade, pressure them. <laughs> and, and we can also, we can also like do it, document, document the pressure, like Michael Moore style, right? Like Roger and I, like trying to get in touch yeah. with these people. But maybe Fantastic. we don't get in touch with them, but it's like, we tried to, you know, we tried to call them, we tried to email them, we tried to go to their building, we tried to hound them, and they're, you know, this is what they said, well, you know. Well, Michael Moore is coming from an adversarial position usually, Kevin, uh, which which is fine. Uh, but I'm but I'm saying Kevin's is like we can kind of shame them. We can well, shame them a yeah. little bit if they're not going to get in into it, you know. We and Kevin, say, like, oh, you have musical connections. You have L.A. connections. Yeah. Jennifer has connections in the science community. Torstein has connections all over the world. So I suppose if we do sit down and make our own lists, at least to start, I, well, I, I guess well, we, it could. What do you think about pooling the lists? And then we, you know, we take them, one, we say, you know, this is, divvy them up somehow. We say this is Sandy's preferred interview candidate. Then we all collectively try and get their attention just by weight of numbers. Because... We're all small fry, and these guys, I mean, the guys I would like to have on my list are probably, out, we're punching out of our league by a long shot. But I think they could be pressured to do it if there are enough people and enough channels. So if there's a big enough base and it looks like it's popular enough, I think that we could possibly get their attention. Would Something. we have any printed media to, 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 to um, you know, proliferate? I mean, would somebody be responsible for writing our mission statement um, or I something? Are we we go? I, I think we're just putting a toe in the water now. I mean, uh, really what I, I would think, since these people can't probably really afford to endorse such a radical action as we're proposing, I would say that what we're doing is due diligence to decide just how big a movement would have to be to achieve the result of, you know, basically a collapse of the derivatives market through default. So that and, and finding all the unknown gotchas. But I, I think that's all the commitment is at this point. It might be nice to have something up on Reddit or something so we could, we could actually coordinate just hounding these people, just recruiting them for interviews. Hey, um, hey guys. Really good for an yeah. Uh, I, apo I apologize. I have to go. I apologize, but I'm, 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 I want to continue the discussion and I, I think a Reddit idea is, you know, Reddit thread is a good idea, but I have to go right now. So um, thank you for the discussion. And, and uh, thank you for your so contribution. Much, Keep up the good fight, brother. Thank, thank, you. thank you for coming. Great suggestions. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, yeah, the, um, it, you know, one of the things that, I think would be valuable is 
if we kept a very public record of everything we did, even if it doesn't go very far with us, um, it is basically some, um, basically a body of research for other people who want to try this can learn from, from what we do. As long as we make our, you know, strategies public and everything we do as public as possible and record it. Via a Reddit list? Is that what I, you're I saying? I like so Reddit. Set up a I, list? I, Reddit I, <laughs> you know, I, I like Reddit. I don't know what everybody else feels. I mean, what does the audience feel? I mean, can, can we ask? Yeah, that's all? where I usually get my, I, the, the, the majority of my ideas come from my own listeners. And they are, they are the sources for people writing in and asking me to please interview this person. That, that is the number one way that I find uh, my, my, in, in my interviewees, but I, but I admit that this is a little bit of an esoteric topic, and I don't think that uh, either one of my channels is gonna be flooded with uh, recommendations from my listeners about, about this. But again, brother, I, I am all ears. And so if you want any names you come up with, I mean, that is, as long as they pass my muster and then I get the second opinion from my fellow in Brazil, as long as we are both for it, I'm, I'm, happy, to, I'm happy to do it. And that's really uh, all. What channels, do your viewers, what channels do your viewers use to recommend people or request? Well, well, mostly Collapsed Chronicles. Uh, now, I run all my interviews on both, on, on both of my channels, on Collapsed Chronicles and Humpty Dumpty Tribe, but they are originally aired on Collapsed Chronicles. And, and do, how do they communicate with you? Through the comments section, or do they send you emails? Or both. Either, either just through public comments on the page or private emails. I get both. Yeah. So where, where can we have a place that has a good record? I mean, uh, you know, Reddit makes sense to me because we can have a poll at the end of it to say, you Yeah, know, Torstein's already got yeah. it set up. It's our collapse on Reddit, and we'll all join it and get in. And everybody that's watching this can get in on it, and we can have a lot of voices in conversation all together. That's oh, yeah. and, and another excellent place is LinkedIn, believe it or not. No, I don't want to use LinkedIn. No, no, I don't like it's LinkedIn. too corporate. No yeah, freaking way am I using LinkedIn. Nope. Yeah, nope. I'd hate oh, LinkedIn. You would be shocked, Sandy, how many doomers are going in on LinkedIn. Yeah, I, but that's a professional I, site, and I don't want to do that. But I don't think a lot of us would want to. Well, Jennifer, be, what do you think of all this? Um... You know, for me, to be honest with you, it's it's a big thing to take on board and it's it's difficult because I've been very committed to my finances and, you know, le leaving, leading a responsible life, you know, and being independent and successful and all things like that. And it's it's a hard idea for me to to take on board. And that's okay. There's a lot of us that feel that way. I mean, we have a lot to, to, to lose. But just what Lord, you said about threatening with a letter of intent type of thing could be just what we need to start with. Yeah, nobody knows whether you carry through with this or not, right? <laughs> it's, no. it's really it's really about activism. I I wouldn't ask for personal commitment from anybody to carry through well, with this. Yeah, well, 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 that the the, the, the quote threatening or, or the Michael Moore adversarial position is not <laughs> I M O at all. It's, A letter of intent. It, it's uh, it's it, it's an invitation to. Uh, be interviewed and, and as much as I, I would like to get in screaming matches with half of uh, my, my guests uh, I mean I'm going to approach it from a very polite and uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to come at it from an adversarial position. Well that wasn't really the way a letter of intent would be. It yeah. would be a professionally written letter just stating fact 
This is my letter of intent. I intend to default on my debt on November 5th, 2019. And whatever else that sounds a little bit, you know, uh, official, legal, whatever, but it would be respectful and professional. This is a professional thing to do. It's not just yeah, you're being well, We're not talking about threatening the interview candidates. We're talking oh, about threatening the right, establishment. I just wanted to make a... Okay, I, 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 just, okay, I just wanted to make sure we had uh, communication on that, brother. That, uh, we could even you know, call we, We're this trying to make the establishment shiver in their boots. We're not yeah. trying to make uh, interview yeah. candidates. It could be Worldwide <laughs> Letter of Intent Day. There you go. So... We, we don't want to, as I say, y'all can keep me in the loop, but uh, I, I'm going to sound somewhat like Jennifer that I've got, I have got so much on my plate. And so uh, do we all. And, so and, that's why we're just fleshing it out. Life, I am, I am glad to be of assistance, but I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to commit to being really proactive. Uh, I'm glad to join you, but you guys are going to have to do the legwork and then bring me in as a as a comrade. I'm I'm, I'm glad to join from that perspective. That, that works. I mean, it's uh, whatever amount of commitment you want works with this because it's it's really flexible. We could bring the indigenous communities in. I think they might. Uh, be interested in this because got, they're in a lot of actions. Yeah, I got a comment on on my video um, from somebody that I asked her if she would be an interview candidate because she was straight out of that. Ms. Gilbert. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, she, we're all in the same circles. <laughs> we oh, all know yeah, each yeah. other. Yeah, so she said some amazing stuff. Um, I think that would definitely be it because I think that there are a lot of people, you know, basically on the forefront of this of this debt war. Um, we're all pretty liberal and, um, you know, comfortable uh, bourgeois, I'm afraid, this group. But there's a lot of people there on the front lines of a debt struggle. Um, and so, you know, maybe we should find out about their story. That would be interesting. Um, so you mentioned about collapse thing. So Torsten, you actually the moderator on collapse. Uh, can you hear me, Ivan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah cool. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't moderate anything uh, except my own channel going south, but. Um, you know, our collapse, I read it collapse. It's, uh, it's a, an amazing group that's just past 100,000 members or subscribers. But are you, but are you the one who spearheaded that, Torsten? You're not the one who started that, are you? Do you think I wouldn't boast of it if, uh, I, if I, I had know. started it? I would be shocked if you had not. <laughs> I haven't started it, for God's sake. I'm just saying it just passed 100,000 subscribers, and it's uh, where things happen, as well as that. Uh, and uh, when I post on Reddit, I only post, post on our collapse. Because I just got an email from them, literally since, this, uh, since we went on air, an email has just come in, finally, that I, am, I have been approved as a commentator. Because it's been real hard for us to post. My buddy in Brazil just said, screw it. That it it's so hard for him to post my interviews from Collapse Chronicles. And he, he, he just said he's not willing to, to do the job. It's such a hassle to post an interview. I'm a complete Luddite. I, I think I, I, I ran you an email. I would absolutely love you to take on the task of posting, uh, e even if you want to rip them and put them on your channel and post them from your channel. I, you know, I mean, I'm a, so I just want them up there and they're not getting posted because I don't know how to do it. And, uh, and mm. my buddy in Brazil, he knows how to do it, but he says for how much, how much hassle it is, he's not willing to. So I wish they could make it easier to post things on there. It is done, done easy. It's, it's the easiest thing since sliced bread. You just have to learn it. It takes two two seconds to learn it. Well, 
you should see me try to slice bread. I, I, I cannot slice bread. I, you, you know, the thing about sliced bread is already sliced in the shop. <laughs> Anyway, well, not, I'm not posted. I would love starting to be a technical with conversation with, with anyway. Well, this is getting right beyond now. the purview of our conversation. But anyone who wants to post my interviews on on Reddit Collapse, by all means, the job is available. Okay, we got one tech support job going. Uh, do we have any votes for how we, what forum we manage this in? And uh, is there anybody up for this? I don't know about managing, but I will join the Reddit collapse that Torstein was talking about, even though nobody could hear him except us. Um, and then maybe everyone else will come on board. And those, that's already an established group with like a, yes. a million, a zillion of people. So we could join in with this video as the introduction yeah. to us. What do you think, Torstein? Just go yes or no, because nobody can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we manage this on collapse then. Sure, and we'll get, we'll 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 communicate more, and we'll tell everybody what's going on. And I okay, so okay, I'll, I'll I'll post soliciting interview candidates. Shall I? So we get a pool, and and then should we ma match it up with uh, the channels that Osama got? Osama number five, he got a long list of channels. Um, that yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, cool. Okay, so, all right. Let's do it on collapse then. Is that, is that motion carried? Do I have a second? Aye. Yeah. I will <laughs> second that one. I have to find someone to do it. <laughs> Okay, well, that's that's cool. I mean, I think that's everything that was on the agenda to to cover in this. So, um, let's post this video and pick it up in collapse and and carry on from there. I think that's awesome. Can I just add one point for the uh, agenda? Oh yeah, go ahead. I would just say that. Uh, um, it's also my my uh, my wish that Car Cartago should be bombed or something. Wow, that's an old joke from from the Greek Empire. Carthage, <laughs> you Carthage. Want to bomb Carthage. Yeah. Carthage. Are you, are you Roman? <laughs> you said Carthage should be burned. Bombed. No, it's, bombed. It's just a Roman joke. But uh, I, can I can I finish with um, my ethical? Um, uh, thought. Um, I wish people yeah, could yeah, hear that, you. Yeah, they Let's can. Go. Well, the thing is, uh, uh, there's a there's a difference between just uh, you know uh, leaning back and watching the world burn, you know, and 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 actually going in and making it collapse, you know, by by our own will or our own, own concerted actions. I mean, it's it's. Um, at least to me, who studied uh, philosophy and ethics and bioethics at university, uh, it's like it gets complicated because uh, every time you want to do something good, you know, hundreds of bad things happen. It's the same with the, the geoengineering. If you spray sulfur in the atmosphere, tons of fish will die in the rivers and everything. And, and it, it, it sort of, if you are going to do something beyond just threatening to uh, to uh, default debts, right? If you're going to actually do it and actually collapse the economic systems, we have to think about all these uh, uh, domino effects, follow-on effects with, with like uh, nuclear power stations going belly up and, and all of that. And uh, I'm just, you know, thinking about people closest to me and my, my old family and everything. I can't, I feel I can't sort of take responsibility for furthering the collapse or, or, or um, you know, putting it closer in time than it would otherwise be. So I think it's a lot of, lot of things we have to, to, to discuss here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that um, 
uh, there's a question uh, whether the ice uh, the ice tipping point already happened, like in the 70s or 60s. So, so if, if this idea to, to, to default the depths is only meant to prevent the tipping point from being reached, then it's a, it's a no go, and it's a no starter, right? Um, yeah, so, okay, so first off, I'd say this truly is what you say. It's, um, it's setting, a, setting, setting a match to burn the house down. Now, I, from my point of view, I think we're in a gulag. I think we're in a labor camp, and it's going to turn into a death camp um, before climate emergency is, is through with us. Um, so what I characterize it as is we, we're in a basically Auschwitz situation and it's a difficult ethical question because I'm saying that we torch the whole death camp. This is really a proposal to torch the death camp. Now, the first objection is who's going to feed us? Uh, we, the kitchen's going to go with this. Um, and so, yeah, we are preempting the end of the death camp, we're also basically uh, Im imposing suffering on everybody. Mm. It's torturous, ethically speaking, because if you let it run, I think we're all going to wind up in a gas chamber, effectively. Um, the equivalent thereof, the establishment will eventually manage our extinction in, you know, a, a brutal way. We, we're looking at um, the four horsemen, we're looking... See, one of the things involved in this, in a death strike, is also what uh, it would remove the ability for these bastards to make war. And there's every sign that they go into war. I mean, before John R. Bolton has finished his term, I can imagine at least three wars will be chalked up on his bedpost. And uh, they're moving a carrier into the Gulf now, which is a clear move for mobilization against Iran. So I think Iran, Venezuela, and China are slated for war. We're moving towards war with them. And this might uh, remove their ability to wage war. So it's immensely complicated. But you are right. Yeah. In essence. It's but, very but that's the, that's, the, um, that's the second counterpoint, is that uh, uh, are we really sure that it's a long time before it collapses anyway? You know, because if it collapses like... Uh, 12 months from now, then we don't really have to do all this uh, effort, you know? Yeah, so you, well, you see, this is the thing. There is, I, I make the point that it is preparation. So it's, I, in my view, okay, this is where I'm at. I, I think we passed the tipping points. For me, this is psychologically important. For one thing, to prepare people so that basically when the shock happens, you can blunt the shock uh, just because people have been aware of it, uh, there's a lot of psychological evidence that if you prepare people in advance when the actual event happens, it's not as painful as they are. That's why the doctor says to you, uh, this may hurt, because there's a lot of um, clinical evidence that if he says that first, that when it hurts you, it's not as bad as if he just walks up behind you and jabs you in the arm. <laughs> Uh, we're about to get a jab in the arm uh, that humanity has never had before. So the, the argument is that if people know about it in advance, and hence the discussion of what we're, we're opening up a discussion and trying to open up as make it as mainstream and wide as possible, that creates awareness which reduces pain. Um, the, the other thing is if they cause or are perceived even to have caused the collapse, so that's psychologically a lot more uh, positive than if they are victims of a collapse. So even if the debt strike and the collapse happened more or less simultaneously, or at least in some kind of conjunction, they would be hard to tell if one caused the other. Uh, they were, I imagine that kind of thing would be hotly debated. But you can imagine it in terms of the conservative and the mainstream media dialogue, because it would be, was the ship so rotten that it sank, or was it the bastards, the torpedo that, that sank it? But either way, you're over the climate change the denial stage by far, just by the fact that you forced them into that conversation. 
And mm. I like the idea of giving people the positive power. So basically they will feel like giant killers. And most people don't know that the economy is teetering on the brink and it's a Jenga castle that's about to implode and it's a staggering drunk that's going to fall flat on his face anyway. So they will feel that it, by a collective action, they knocked over this giant. They will feel like Jack the Giant Killer. And I think that prepares them well for the next stage where we, we're going to have to get resilience into the system. There are other things like the mass production and mass distribution food system. And essentially, people don't realize that behind all these brands on the shelf, there are only five centralized uh, food companies. So from a food security point of view, we're in a dismal state and we should be, you know, basically um, uh, localizing crop, uh, crops and getting rid of uh, mass, mass agriculture. So a collapse of the system forces people into things like homesteading and forces people to recover some of these crops. Some of these crops, the, in fact, all of the crops, really the grain crops that we survive on, only survive with the Harbour Bosch process uh, with fertilizer, herbicides, pesticides. Uh, they are a tool of uh, industrialization. They're an inseparable from a mass production system. Uh, we have to get off those uh, crops and recover some of the older crops that uh, are more diverse, more resilient, uh, more nutritious. And, the, and you can only do that by doing local scale farming. So uh, basically, yeah, just your um, Dr. Smith video that I just watched now, he raises that point and he says that, um, you know, we, grandma survived the depression because she sourced her food locally from her victory garden in the back. Um, so we have to go through that because the, if there's going to be a collapse, I don't think anybody can deny there will be a collapse anyway. Uh, it's very important that people start recovering these skills early. They start thinking about homesteading, just answering questions like what do you do in these vast states that could not possibly support uh, their populations with victory gardens? Um, you're raising some, highlighting th things like what has happened to other people. If you take like uh, Bosnia in Sarajevo, uh, they were under fire and they started victory gardens. They were under conditions that we are probably likely to face in some of the Duma scenarios. And they did wonderful things. They pulled together. They helped each other. Although they were starving, although they had to walk through sniper fire to just harvest food in their victory gardens, they had victory gardens on their balconies. They became resilient and helped each other with seeds and food in the midst of starvation. It's important that people realize this and have a model uh, for, or for what's coming because there are some bleak scenarios. You just have to look at some of the prepper channels to see how these guys are planning to tackle, you know, the shit, it's the fan moment, and it's gruesome. I mean, it's, there are some very dark ways to go. And people that came out of uh, experiences like Sarajevo, they said, although they were starving, um, there, there were a lot of people killed under siege in Sarajevo. There were also fantastic humanitarian stories, and the best of humankind came out. I think that people have to be told about models like that uh, to make sure that people can live those and not do this lager mentality and hunker down in a bunker. I think, that, I think that Dr. Smith is absolutely right. The very rich that go and try and scuttle away on planes to New Zealand, I don't think they're going to get on those planes. Those planes are going to be stolen from out from under them by the crews. And, uh, you know, they, they're going to have a knife in their back before they get to the, to the getaway plane. Uh, and so the very top and the preppers and the bunkers, they, I know what happened to them in South Africa. We were heading for genocide and those guys had to line their kids up and shoot them one by one in front of the rest of the family. That's how they went out. So I think we should start discussing these things now because the examples for what happens all over the world, but the discussion at the moment, if you look in the prepper community, it's absolutely dismal. It's, it's, it's juvenile, it's, it's polluted by Hollywood bullshit. Uh, it's nothing like what we're going to be going through. And it's so unnecessary. There's real evidence. They're real people. You could get people from Sarajevo to tell you what these situations are like. No one wants to do Not that. Not only it's Sarajevo, so but Serbia and, and all these other countries. The thing is, how do you get the buy-in? It can't just be, I mean, in this 
how do we get the buy-in? And I guess we'll have to flesh this out of the global. But we start small. We, we, we just start with us. Start with us and just, just I mean, it's, it's a conversation, right? That's all it is at the moment. Um, yeah. It's just exploratory. And, and it, it, we must explore these, these things. I mean, I would put number one is the, the real gotchas like climate gotchas like McPherson paradox. But number two is exactly what Torsten says is, is, the, is it's a, a moral quagmire. I see it as a moral obligation to burn down, you know, the concentration camp that you're in uh, because you, it's a known death camp. And your first obligation is to burn that down and worry about how everybody gets fed tomorrow. Um, but, of course, you're taking There's action. There's going to be stuff there. Yeah. But that, that's where we had it. You see, I mean, that alone, it's, people have got to start thinking about this. That people, I mean, Brexit uh, is, is really underneath it all, um, I believe, is, is uh, the government's preparing for these kind of climate emergencies and mass migration. And they thinking in terms of, well, we must establish the channel as a crowd control barrier. And Trump's doing the same with the wall. It's not all a xenophobic scratch that, that he wants to itch. It's genuine crowd control because they're expecting, you know, masses of, of caravans coming up because of climate emergencies. And I'm seeing them preparing for these kind of events. And people should be asking questions like, you know, maybe you're being a little bit arrogant. The Britain doesn't support itself. About half its food is, is coming from imports. And you should start thinking about scenarios like maybe you're the immigrants. You might have to be, you know, emigrating your population so that, you know, Britain can survive as an island. Um, that, you know, it's kind of arrogant to think the pound's going to be able to support everybody and, they, you know, the, the food system's going to collapse and they will still be feeding, you know, 60 million people in Britain. Uh, those people might have to be exported to Canada. They might be the refugees. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think all these topics should be discussed at this point. And although people, there's so many doomers around, nobody's discussing the really hard shit. But, I mean, who on this channel denies that we, we're not going to see something like Sarajevo in our lifetime? Mm -hmm. Live through it. Does anybody want to pledge that? Okay. I don't know. I see, I see what I see when I go to city and driving through uh, areas that, where the trees are dying and I see nothing changing in uh, the covering up of every single green space possible with concrete and buildings. I don't see anything that is remotely showing me that there's any kind of change in the capitalist industrial civilization we live in. So I think we know that it's safe to say it's one of these situations where you know for certain what happens you know that there's collapse. It has to come because this cannot go on. What we don't know is, is uh, when. But I'm saying, man, we should be having these conversations, shouldn't we? They're hard, but I mean, it's okay. like, come on, Grandma, you know you stage four cancer. What do you want to do about the house and the cat? You know, it's... it's these hard conversations, right? Can I suggest um, uh, Jennifer is um, is uh, making a recording of this whole talk, and that's the only recording where people can hear me talk. That's <laughs> it's right. It's the only it's the only decent recording, actually. So can I suggest that you you get Jennifer's uh, version by email or something, and then you. Somebody uploads it uh, and posts it on Reddit, on Reddit Collapse. Is that a good uh, idea? Because then we, can, then we can start this conversation in the Reddit uh, milieu uh, by having this, uh, this video. Is that? Great suggestion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'll be uploading this to G Drive and I'll just send you guys the link on the same email that I sent you the invite. Yeah. Great. 
I'll probably be keeping uh, this version uh, or the version that I'm streaming now as well because that goes automatic and I would get, I'm, I'm imagining I'm, I would get a lot of views on, on that version, even though people can't oh, hear Oh, everybody it. wishes they could hear you. Words of wisdom. <laughs> I've been trying to type <laughs> out what you've type. been saying. Huh? I've been trying to type out what you've been saying. Yeah, I, I tried to help them as well, but now my my phone has gone dead. No battery. Well, so, then yeah. perhaps we have accomplished what we set out to do for this evening, and we should bid everybody adieu and thank Sam and Kevin, who had to leave, and Torstein and Jennifer for setting this whole thing up, and Lord, you for being this inspirational brain that popped in out of nowhere but got us all very much involved in some different kind of thinking and strategy than we had been before. I'm so pleased uh, how it's come out. I mean, it's, I think we covered so much and we might be pilloried for some of, well, I might be pilloried for some of the stuff I've said, but um, I don't know. I mean, I think some people are in a rut in the Duma community and they're looking for an advance in the conversation. And I think this is it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Jen? Let's hope so. Yeah, well, it's definitely new territory. And um, more than anything, it's putting together so many more dots. You know, it's joining in the economy with abrupt climate change and with CO2 and the relationships intertwined between all of them. And it's it's irrevocable and it's sad. And I, I always have such mixed feelings. Um, having these conversations, it's it's... It's enlightening and sad and difficult all at the same time. But that's why we yeah. also have support. And we have yeah. those people out there that are developing all the support networks for, for this community. So avail yourself. Absolutely. You're not alone. You're not yeah. alone. We're all here together, aren't we? Yeah, this is how we develop support. Yeah. Can we have the last word from Hambone? Is he, or has he fallen asleep? Hambone, you still there? Oh, the, the, uh, my, my last word, as always, keep up the good fight and get out there and enjoy it while you still can. Absolutely. I, okay. I don't, know, I don't know what else to say. When you boil it all down, that is all that's left to say. Keep up the good fight and get out there and enjoy it while you still can. Thanks, guys. Um, smoke them if you got them. And there's that, too. Peace, everybody. <laughs> Peace Let's go. Thanks for coming. Okay. Bye, guys. Thanks again.